to the last test seminar for the semester. And uh, I have to confess that next week, uh, I've been asked to go down to Townsville to meet with the VC for our annual so-called distinguished professors lunch. And that's on Wednesday. And so I'm not gonna be here on Wednesday. And so I won't be here to introduce my good mate, Nigel Tucker, who will be talking about some very interesting work that he's been doing uh, up on the Atherton Tableland. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce Ruben Clements. Ruben was my first uh, student, postgrad student at JCU. And uh, I really got lucky with Ruben, you know, with, with postgrad students, you don't really know. Um, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not so great. And sometimes they're fantastic. And Ruben was one of these guys that just immediately leapt off the page and in every way as being really outstanding. He had an offer of a full PhD fellowship, a full PhD scholarship to the, to the University of Cambridge. But he was also interested in coming to JCU and working with our group. And, uh, and JCU, I have to say, scrambled around and managed to get him a full scholarship very, very quickly because we didn't want to lose him. And we're really happy we didn't. Uh, Ruben's returned to his, uh, I guess Singapore is your native home, but he's married to a Malaysian woman and he's been in Malaysia for so long that he's uh, effectively, I think, almost an honorary Malaysian these days. Yeah. Uh, Ruben's uh, at the University of um, Malaysia and he's got several high levels. He's a full professor now. He's an associate dean uh, of research. Um, he's had many honors. Uh, he did his undergraduate training and uh, master's degree training at the National University of Singapore, which, of course, is an outstanding university. And he worked with a guy named Navjot Sodi, who's kind of legendary in the realms of tropical conservation biology. And unfortunately, Navjot uh, died prematurely, but he left behind a very uh, outstanding legacy, including people like Ruben. I could say a lot more things about Ruben, but I just want to say this. He is a person a conservation biologist and, and conservation scientist who lives the, lives the dream. He, he is out there working in the forefront, in the trenches, and battling all the time with an NGO that he and his wife have set up. And uh, he's, an ex he's not just a researcher, he's also a real true blue conservationist and, and someone who cares a lot about developing country like Malaysia. So anyway, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Ruben to talk about Kenya for life. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you very kind words and good afternoon, everyone. Nice to be back virtually to my alma mater, I guess. <laughs> um, hey, um, so my screen is visible. Yeah. All right. So today I'm going to talk about Kenya for life. It's the place where I did most of my PhD field work, as Bill mentioned. And I'm really grateful to be back here to share with you what I have gone through in Kenya and what we plan to do in the coming years. So hopefully all of you in the audience who might be interested to come in, coming to Malaysia once the restrictions are lifted to potentially collaborate. And as Bill mentioned, that's my day job. I'm at the local university, it's called Sunway University. And I teach biodiversity, biostatistics, and also teach master's program in the Jeffrey Sachs Center for Sustainable Development. And a lot of what I've learned in Kenya over the last few years has really made me who I am today. And that's why I want to stick around in this landscape to try to secure the future of forests, wildlife, and people in this amazing watershed, which is around 200,000 hectares, hopefully for life, in the sense that we want to protect the life in the forest, but also secure long-term financing. Because as an NGO, it's been a struggle trying to secure grants and what we want to do is change the model, come up with a new business case to finance forest conservation. And that's something we're moving into the next few years. And I want to devote the next few years of my life to try to save as much the rainforest as possible. Again, I was really touched and blessed by visiting the rainforest in Cairns. And it's not very similar and hopefully get to visit Malaysia one day and come to Kenya. So today's content, I'm just going to give a short a description of my journey from Cairns to Kenya. Some people pronounce it Kenya, but actually Kenya. And why Kenya? Apart from it being my PhD site, I want to give you some idea of why we're sticking around to protect it. And 
touching a bit about what our new project is. It's called Kenyan for Life. It's basically an evolution of what I've been doing the last few years since my PhD. And finally, touch on the current research we're doing and also the future research opportunities, potentially, if you might want to collaborate with me and my university and organization. So I've just started off with a, a tribute to Bill. I mean, one of the reasons why I decided to come to Kenya was because, again, Bill is legendary, not for his... Uh, martial arts skills, but also is, is from tremendous work in conservation science. Um, he was one of my, one of the first people who kind of believed in me and said, hey, Ruben, I think I, you know, we can work together on something. And I met Bill in Switzerland one day at a conference, and I think we never looked back. So Bill was really a, a real, real important figure in my career, but along the way also, don't have your photos, but you know, we have got a couple of co-supervisors, uh, Susan Lawrence and Bill and Miriam Gusem, who also helped me in the journey. But Bill was the only one that came to Malaysia and we rented a vehicle, just scouting out for potential PhD projects. And yeah, we had some time to stop and smell the flowers, so to speak. This is a Reflesia, which doesn't really have a nice smell. But at the same time, Bill was around. Um, he was actively following me just to see what potential projects we could do and on some of the devastating scenes we saw in the forest were you know rainforest being cleared for plantations and roads going in the forest and that really got me inspired to perhaps uh, do something about it and that's why we we thought all these small roads or logging roads were real insidious problems in the landscape so we formed um, a project together and it was really called the environmental and social effects of roads in malaysia and if you're not sure where Kenya is, there's a little dot here in the peninsula of Malaysia. And it's catchment is what 200,000 hectare watershed. Was where, was where I am working now and where I did start my PhD. So my PhD fieldwork was really mainly in this pink area here. It's a locked over forest and there was a road, a road passing through it. And on these roads, there were highway viaducts. Of course, one of the first few things we saw when we went through there were you know, amazing wildlife, like elephants crossing the road. And that really got me interested to stick around and see, are these wildlife actually using these highway viaducts? And that was one of the main chapters of my PhD, trying to find out whether highway viaducts were effective crossing structures for mammals. So what, we, what I found out from my PhD was really that they were okay for herbivores, large herbivores like elephants or tapirs, but large carnivores tend to avoid it. So that was one of the main findings and published a few papers from my, my PhD thesis. And what did I do with the results? Well, that, that really was really useful when I started getting more into lobbying. And I, really, I went to the state government and told them, hey, this is a really important corridor. I spoke to the state government of officials and they decided to kind of halt the development uh, for a while. And it was covered in Mongabe back then. So this was probably one of the highlights of my PhD actually using the science to inform decision making. But well, right now, where my thesis lies is really just uh, <laughs> a stand for my laptop. And hopefully, those of you in the audience who are still graduates, or uh, sorry, graduate students, uh, will find better use of your PhD. <laughs> but at, at least you know, the results were used to publish a few papers and and got some small wins in conservation, which is what I was hoping for. And then after that, Bill actually gave me a two-year postdoc. And again, very grateful to be part of the team that, that I was a co-author on this, this uh, nature paper that came out a few years ago. And of course, that tremendous impact. And that really got me on my way, gave me a good start into academia. So again, I'm really grateful to Bill and Susan and Miriam for all the support that got me into first in academia as well as giving me the chance to still practice conservation as a practitioner. So let's move on to why Kenya, I mean, apart from that being my first love, uh, second love after my wife, the forest there was really teeming at wildlife. And during my PhD, I found out that there were actually tigers roaming the area. And that was one of the precursors of the project that I started after my PhD was to look for donors to start a tiger conservation project. So I was lucky to meet Pantera, Wilhelm Park Zoo, and after, after that Rainforest Trust, which provided funding 
for me and my team to really monitor and protect tigers in this 1,200 square kilometer area. So the PhD site was here. But eventually, we ex expanded the whole site into the protected area. If you're, not, if you're familiar with Malaysia, the Taman Negara is the large protected area, and that's we wanted to see how tigers were doing in the core area. And we found out it was actually a globally important tiger landscape. The place where I worked was also a very important national wildlife corridor. It's uh, called Primary Linkage 7. So Peninsula Malaysia, the federal government identified all these potential corridors that you can link fragmented forests up. And we just so happened to be working one of them. And we were trying to see how we can protect this vital corridor, which allows animals to pass from Taman Negara right into the other forests northwards. And I'm great, grateful to all the camera traps provided through my PhD, Brian James School University, as well as subsequently subsequent donors. But we captured all these amazing wildlife in the area, about 46 large mammal species. We had 290 species of birds, 16 of which of the mammals were on the red list. And again, hopefully we can come down one day to see and Bill's been here. Hopefully Bill can come back again soon. But if you're interested to work with us right now, I'm more keen if you want to help me save more forests. And as you know, the big issue these days is trying to mitigate climate change. And we are trying to attract investors to finance forest conservation and all this goal. If you want to protect, uh, you want to fight climate change, protection of the, the large the terracotta forest is key. I mean, like Dr. Greg Exner has also said that in terms of carbon storage, the Southeast Asian forests store more carbon per hectare than other places on the planet, including the Amazon. So it's a great place to be. And if you want to be part of the solution, trying to invest in forest protection in Southeast Asia is really key, and especially in Malaysia. We also have high functional diversity, and that's also very important to protect carbon storage. And our research has shown that deformation has, will really infect the effectiveness of carbon storage. So what we uh, have in Malaysia is still a relatively intact biodiverse uh, flora and fauna. And as you go towards other parts of ASEAN, you get more deformated forests. So really where you put your money is trying to protect the high functional diversity in our forests because it'll do better at maintaining the carbon storage because you don't want projects to face asset impairment risks in the future. That's what uh, people who want to purchase carbon credits are interested in. They don't want to see all these long-term uh, negative effects without good intact fauna there. And why also we are working in Kenya, why is it important? Not just for the biodiversity, not just for the big trees, but also for communities. We have indigenous communities living in the area and in and around the area, they use the Kenyan forests which for foraging, which are also a chance for them to participate in low impact ecotourism opportunities. And that's what we want to do. We want to try to empower the local indigenous people to become stewards of the forest through potential ecotourism uh, livelihoods. Again, uh, this, this, uh, this Kenya is really vital for all three components in fact to mitigate climate change for biodiversity and for local communities. So what was, it, what was life like for me after my PhD? I was really um, in the middle of it, actually decided to form an NGO. So my wife and I, Dr. Shima Aziz, we formed the NGO because of the wildlife there. And this particular animal was kind of an inspiration. We saw, we saw I found this melanistic leopard uh, crossing the road when I was about to go in the forest. So fun fact, more than 90% of leopards in Peninsula Malaysia are melanistic. For some reason, it's a bot genetic bottleneck. So we mostly get the melanistic leopards, not the spotted ones here. And in Kenya, we just we've published, published a study in general wildlife management, first ever density estimate of, of uh, melanistic leopards in the, uh, in the world. And that's study actually came from Kenya. So Rimba was the NGO that we formed, it means jungle in Malay, and the leopard basically forms the M in between Rimba. And what we do is conduct conservation research to produce evidence-based management recommendations so that decision makers have more information to mitigate threats to biodiversity. And we started this during my PhD. And since then, you know, we've grown to 
become relatively large. We got now 35 full-time staff and kind of raised more than $3 million in 2012. Dr. Shima, she works on large fruit bats, which you have in Australia, the flying foxes. Uh, she's in love with them and she's trying to protect them as much as possible, getting more attention and awareness. She has her own project called Project Europas. In Kenya, then I started this project with the help of our funders, Pantera and Wulam Park Zoo. It's called Harima Salamania, I mean, Tigers Forever in Malay. And subsequently, we also formed other projects. We had a limestone ecosystem ma mapping project, which we just finished. And also right now we have, we're just about to finish a project involving the development of conservation canines to help the wildlife department detect wildlife contraband. This got some support from the US government. So all in all, we've been busy starting projects. So RIMBA is really like a, a platform for young scientists to come, start their projects and eventually go on and start do their own thing. So in Kenya, what was Harimau Salamaya trying to do? Well, first of all, um, it was, we noticed a lot of poaching in the area and there was a lot of Indo-Chinese poachers coming in from uh, Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand, laying snares in the forest. We also had local people, but we found out from the signs that most of the impact, the negative impact was coming from the Indo-Chinese poachers. So it set snares that animals get caught in. This is some kind of, uh, some look hunting from local communities, but again, most of the snares end up trapping tigers, pangolins, sun bears, for example. And all this is to feed the demand in Vietnam and China. And we have kind of traced out the routes in which local wildlife are smuggled by land as well as the sea through trawlers into Vietnam and further up into uh, the wildlife uh, trade hub, wild meat consumption hubs in, in Vietnam and China. So. Again, this has been alluded to one of the reasons why we're having this pandemic. And that's why it's really important to make sure that poaching is reduced in the area. I'm going to show you a short video of, of what really got us riled up to try to reduce the poaching. And because this is well, some of the images we saw in during my PhD were kind of disturbing and life changing, which is why I decided to stick around and help save the story of one of the tigers that we caught in the trap. Some of you might be seeing this for the first time in the audience, and that's again 
uh, one of the images that we caught during my PhD, which I felt was really important to address. Poaching was quite rampant. And so I decided to use some of the science. You know, we used some of the science I learned during my PhD. For example, we used uh, methods in maximum entropy modeling to model where poaching hotspots were. We used a combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning to also predict where poaching hotspots were that allowed us to try to net more poachers. So before the project started with funding, I saw a couple of dead elephants and there were dead tigers. I only found one, I managed to remove one snare and of course I could not apprehend any poachers. I mean, I was a researcher and I couldn't do much about it. But after 2014, um, we managed to work with the wildlife department and through our research, you know, we no longer have any dead elephants or tigers. We helped arrest 36 poachers uh, in that time, 23 of which were prosecuted and also removed more than 259 snares. And all this is really because it was all this is based on science. You know, we used the modeling approaches to try to predict where we might find the poachers as well as the snares. And well, over the course of five years, you can see there's still relatively high turnover of tigers. Um, tigers we found in 2014 in yellow, for example, we only found one of them in 2018 and there were new recruits. You know, tigers in other colors indicate new recruits, but you can see uh, really high turnover and it indicates that you know, poaching elsewhere outside Kenya was potentially responsible for this. So we're just protecting a small area, but couldn't completely keep out the poachers. Again, this was not easy and this was again down to my team of wonderfully skilled and passionate rangers that we recruited 16 guys and through throughout the course of the period we managed to train them up and show you a short video of how they were trained and we got um, special boat servicemen to come and train in the British army as well to get them so many of More us work in our own coaches. landscapes, in our own sites, and when we get together, uh, especially us uh, field operators on the ground, we observe there's so many things that we can share and we can compare notes. That really helps for us to know what's going on outside of our study areas, how all the bushcraft and all their natural skills and talents that they, they've, been, uh, they've grown up with, how all that can be applied to doing something like anti-poaching. There are new skills we're trying to develop and then employ in the ground and that a lot of the time comes from existing kind of root skills that the patrollers have, ways of doing things that we can then try and refine and that includes natural ability to track poachers so we can move away from being fixated with just pulling snares to then move the shift in focus more towards trying to catch the poacher. So thankfully nobody was hurt in the process. Uh, we apprehend poachers in a very safe way. The wildlife department rolls them up in the hammocks and then they ambush them at dawn. So there were no fire fights, no knife fights. So thankfully nobody was hurt. But the point is we actually used a lot of uh, science and we developed a new system. It's going to hopefully be published in biological conservation soon. It's in, in submission that we are developing a new system in which we can um, monitor and better detect poachers. It's called the Vigilant System and hope it will come out soon after my master's student graduated earlier. Just we saw the lady Lamuayi manages to get it past the finishing line. But what we, what we did was really uh, reduce the poaching risk. And apart from that, it's also a lot of law enforcement capacity building. So when I was a student, I couldn't do any workshops, of course. I was just doing my research. But what we did was we ended up doing more capacity building workshops and we had more than 20 law enforcement workshops and then six prosecution workshops because we noticed that the prosecution officers were not really good at um, getting the, the case uh, to the judge in a, in, a, in a condition that the judge could make a good verdict because a lot of the time the prosecution officers were not well trained so we thought there was a gap. So we got the U.S. Department of Justice in to come and train the law enforcement officers. And we had uh, in the end, one of the successes was one of the judges, they meted out a close to 1.56 million ringgit fine uh, for one of the 
two poachers that we caught, and this was because the judge came to our workshop. So the DOJ was really instrumental in this and what we do in those workshops. It's sort of like this. You know, we had the legal officer from America come First, and provide well, training skill, and I think, honestly, to the prosecution the officers who were previously very scared of talking to the judge. They didn't know how to prosecute no the case. Again, these are some of the gaps that we tried to permission. address. No one can and that really you made a difference. Unless you allow them. So apart from the poaching issue, we were trying to also reduce deforestation risks. So we use a lot of imagery uh, from remote sensing. Thanks to Google Earth, we could then make a case that certain areas in Kenya should be protected. And for example, here we show a relatively pristine forest catchment, but in 2016, the logging came in and that resulted in a lot of sedimentation, uh, slop, the, the watershed. So we were quite annoyed with this, and again, we brought this to the higher-ups. We managed to present this to the royal family at Trangano, and the Sultan Trangano wasn't too pleased about it, so he decided to help out with uh, trying to stop the logging. So again, um, before uh, my PhD, I was just doing my research, couldn't get any area protected. I was not working on legislation, trying to protect areas, and definitely uh, there was not the time for that, but again, after the PhD with the funding, finally managed to get the whole area where I did my study, the 30,000 hectare forest protected legal as a protected area. We helped the government create legislation. The 2017 State Parks enactment was drafted and created a new government agency to help manage the state parks. So again, this I didn't do, the, do this all alone. I have a fantastic team that assisted me. And now we have... Uh, Protected area almost the size of half the size of, of Singapore, which I'm which I'm born in. Hopefully, it can come down to this state park one day. This is what it looks like. It's a beautiful forest, it's still locked over forest. Again, thanks to the political will and my team managed to lobby for this area for the logging to stop. And right now we also involving more of the indigenous peoples in management and empowering them to come to the workshops, getting them empowered to be long-term stewards, involving them in the, developing the management plan is something not many protected areas do. All right, so that's in summary and short of what I finished after my PhD, but then I realized, well, it's not sustainable, you know, always going to the Sultan or lobbying for protection. We need to make area-based conservation effective as well as cost-effective because once you form a traditional protected area, sometimes legislation is there, but on the paper, right? Nobody's really implementing it. Management plan is weak. Financing is minimal. Resources are minimal. Active protection, again, if it's not well funded, you're not going to get it well protected. And again, benefit to local communities are marginal. And most importantly, the state government derives very little benefits from having a protected area because a lot of times the Tourists that come, the sales and goods and sales and services tax, the money goes to the federal government, whether the state government who is actually in charge of the land does not get much money to protect it. So that's, that's that got me thinking after protecting the 3,000 hectares, we need to try to work more with economists, the private sector, come up with green financing solutions, which we believe kind of ticks all the boxes, getting an area managed under a public private partnership might be the way to go when just forming a traditional PA. So can we do this? Well, it's possible. I mean, if you look at the revenue of private sector in Malaysia, for example, this TNB, Maybank, these are all the revenue for one of the years. And this is the revenue of the Trungano state government, tiny in comparison to uh, all these banks and oil and gas companies, even rubber companies, even 7-Eleven makes more money than the state of Trungano. So problem is in, in Malaysia, there's this whole federal state uh, divide. State government is only, state governments like Trangano only know how to derive revenue from natural resource extraction, from logging or providing lands to palm oil for mining. But like, apart from that, they're not able to generate enough sufficient revenue to help keep the economies going. So that's why we, over the last two years or so, I kind of shifted in my, my focus uh, my interest into green or conservation finance. At the end of the day, you don't have the money to protect parks. You know, they become paper parks and eventually biodiversity will, will disappear because there isn't sufficient funding to protect. And grants 
what we're used to as NGOs are not sustainable. So what we're trying to do is really try to increase the level of financial flows from the people who have the money, the have and the have nots, which are mainly the state governments who need funding to better manage the environmental risks. And for example, again, if you're interested in quantitative finance, the bridge taxonomy, you have return-based investments. Um, initially, we toyed doing a debt instrument. We thought of forest bonds or forest super a Sharia compliant bond to try to invite investors to come in, but it was difficult to generate a sufficient return to interest the investors. So then what about economic instruments? Well, taxes and all that, they might take a while to implement. So we thought of doing other things and grants is something as I said, is still very important, but grants are very competitive and we are competing with so many NGOs for the money. What we're interested in key now are a few things, potentially voluntary offsets or trying to talk to the oil palm sector who want to improve their supply chain resilience. We're talking more to potentially get the funding because uh, it's really difficult to just depend on grants all the time. So that's where Kenya for Life is, is where we come in, we're moving forward, we thought of changing our model. So initially, I just summarized and I started out doing my PhD, working on, on ecological research, and I moved on to more conservation practice, trying to actually reduce the poaching, reduce deforestation, create protected areas. But moving on, my interest is now really trying to secure long-term financing via nature-based solutions. That's the buzzword nowadays and something we need to capitalize on. So again, if you're not familiar with nature-based solutions, um, it's something a lot of research is going to next, next phase, trying to develop actions to protect and sustainably manage, restore natural modified systems. It's where we work, we work in a lot over forests and ultimately the funding has to address societal challenges and provide important core benefits for wildlife and people. And this is actually a non-profit social enterprise that is going on, taking on the next phase of what RIMBA is doing. And Nature Climate Solutions, as you know, is probably uh, one of the most important ways to get our temperatures below the two degrees. Even getting 1.5 is tough now, but forests, you know, make up one of the most important solutions. What we're trying to do is to protect the existing forests. And instead of going to the greater areas to kind of replant them, we just want to focus on getting as much of the existing forest as much as possible protected. So over the last year or so, I managed to get assistance from the US-based Conservation Finance Alliance. Uh, if you're interested in grants, they, have, they provide um, startup grants to, to work on conservation finance solutions. And that's what we got initially. And we're also getting some technical support from the World Bank uh, Green Financing Working Group. So what we're really trying to do is get the money from the private sector you know, put in, into a model which is basically a public-private partnership, yeah, intermediary to guide the funding to protect forests and biodiversity in communities. And this is in short what nature-based solutions will aim to achieve. And hopefully some of the forests will be generating returns for the investors. Again, this is, we're not going to, I'm not going to go into detail what kind of investment, invest, what returns they can get. But I'm just going to highlight a couple of ideas that we have in Trangano. So, for the first time in history in Tagano, the state government gave a letter of support or LOI for us to explore voluntary carbon financing to finance this entire 200,000 hectare area watershed in blue. So all this is locked over forest. So we've got a pink area protected already um, in 30,000 hectares, but the goal for Kenya for Life is to get a wider area protected. And so what it essentially is doing is really talking to the private sector who have still tons of money who are interested in their ESG ratings. Uh, if they want to get a favorable rating for to attract investors, especially companies who are on the stock exchange, they want to put money into these four things, biodiversity conservation, climate change mitigation, local community empowerment education, as well as building the capacity of the state park. So let's talk a bit about um, grants now. We're still depending on grants. And unfortunately, uh, we managed to get uh, fortunately, we get some grants from a foundation to kind of start off the, the management of the park. Um, this was funded by the Yaya San Saim Dabi. And then 
right now, sorry, we are moving to see if to see if voluntary offsets could potentially help. So I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, carbon offset offsetters. We have two camps, right? Those who hate it, those who think it is a greenwashing exercise, but those who see, especially like me, you know, I, I cannot see any potential market demand to save forests. And right now there is because people are companies are making their net zero claims. They want to purchase credits. So, well. I know it's not going to solve the problem. We're still using capitalism to fight capitalism, but I do not know of any other way in which at this moment in time, we can get sufficient funding to protect forests in the long run. Hopefully this is a temporary solution, but um, carbon offsets are right now, um, of course, as you know, one of the key drivers of uh, key, key ways in which you can save forests, especially in Malaysia. And then this is where you know MBS comes in. We're not just doing carbon; we're doing other things. I'll explain later. But we come in here as a project developer to try to make sure that um, investors put their money into good projects. And Kenya itself, we've been we're designing a project idea, a project design document. Once you do that, you have to get an auditor to validate it, and verify the credits, and then issue the credits. And this is a whole two to three year process which uh, we are still in the middle of. I, I started out as an ecologist, but now I'm talking to lawyers and bankers and trying to, to understand the lingo, but I'm learning a lot. I mean, it's a fantastic learning curve, but at the end of the day, we hopefully get to develop the credits as an intermediary in the end buyer, the off takers, potentially some of the carbon majors will retire it so that uh, the money goes to the state governments to protect it. So in, Carbon mechanism, market mechanism exists right now in mainly two categories, the compliance market as well as the voluntary market. So that's where we are focusing on in the moment. As you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, negativity surrounding the whole RDD deal with Indonesia and Norway. And again, it take, might take many years for G2G development of, of Red Plus projects, especially in this part of the world. So in the meantime, we can wait, we cannot wait. We need to find a willing buyer willing buyer of the credits and the willing seller hopefully will be the state government if they own the land. And we are hopefully moving towards getting the carbon credits under the VERA, Verified Carbon Standard, and getting a CCB premium out of it, meaning that if you show that your project has, is important for the climate, community and biodiversity, you can actually get higher premium for carbon credits. So that's something we are moving towards. And PCS or verified carbon units are right now the predominantly traded or sold kind of credit on the market. There are the certification, certification standards like the gold standard, and, um, American Carbon Registry, but uh, BCS is by far uh, the main, market, main dominant uh, crediting agency. So why do people want to buy BCS CCP credits? Because they want to see co-benefits cool for the community and that's very important you make sure that money flows from the off taker into benefiting the community and that's what we want to show in our project in Kenya as well as the biodiversity and it's something that people are interested in at the moment so I'm not going to go for you the details but it's a very long process where you need to show additionality you know, without the carbon project what would happen to your landscape if, if it wanted to happen you need to prove that the your carbon credits are actually providing additional benefits. You can't, for example, generate credits from a protected area that's been gazetted for 20 years. You need to show that the project is actually preventing uh, threats to biodiversity and adding on the benefits. So it has to be real, measurable, con and conservative. We have to ensure permanence. Most of these projects are 25-year projects, long-term financing, and then we need to have very transparent verification and uh, auditing processes. So. If you're interested more to find out more, it's really a long process. Right now we are at the stage here, we are validating the project. We've kind of developed it, done the feasibility. And now, right now we are moving towards the stage of auditing and then we can verify the emission reductions and then register the project. So all this is gonna take time, but that's what we aim to do to potentially get more forest protected in Kenya. So I've talked about voluntary offsets, now I'm gonna talk a bit about supply chain resilience and some of the examples. Uh, may come from the oil palm sector. A lot of uh, people, um, if you've seen all the news you know, for Nestle's of the world trying to clean up the supply chain and people want deforestation free products. So that's what they're trying to do. They are 
trying to provide funding to make sure that money goes towards good projects like ours. And for example, the RSPO, they did have a mechanism in which uh, oil palm plantations could there's a sum for that and that was one of the one of the ways in which we started getting more forest protected is to tapping into this compensation liability in which oil pump the oil pump sector has so there's some examples of projects out there that have 25 years of full funding and these are some many in indonesia and ecuador hopefully Kenya will be one of the next projects that receive conservation liability funding and that's what we want to hope that 30,000 hectare state park will start receiving that so in summary you know, we've come a long way since uh, my PhD in 2014 we started out working on enforcement creating protected area but right now we are at a stage where we're trying to secure long-term financing and expand the protected area all right so on to the current and future research what we're doing um, we all right now, well, fortunately, we got a grant from the UK PAC, a government grant from the UK government to try to facilitate decarbonization of economies. And our project is called Putanomics, and in Malay it's called Forest Economics. And this project is really trying to, trying to enable nature-based solutions to facilitate uh, um, forest protection in Malaysia and hoping the private sector will be um, the ones putting the bill. So this is a joint project with the Trungano State Government and the UK PAC agencies. And one of the things that we just formed last year was called the Green Financing Task Force. We managed to get the Economic Planning Unit chair a very important task force where we sit in to try to advise on alternative revenue schemes from standing forests, how to make money from trees. So one of the research components which is currently funded by the UK PAC grant is to develop a forest biomass calculator for the entire peninsula Malaysia. Um, we are using a combination of uh, satellite imagery, and LIDAR data, machine learning to try to develop 30 meter resolution maps in which we can predict how much GHG emissions will there be in a project scenario where you actually protect the forests. So we have the baseline scenario as well as project scenario and try to give these forecasted GHG emissions and eventually this will be used for verification when it comes to the auditing process in Vera. So for example, here, this is the business as usual. If you were not to protect the area and keep logging it, this is how the background biomass density will look like. But if you were to protect the forest and lock it up, manage the carbon, we, we can calculate the amount of gain from the modeling tool. So this really has used more than 3 million data points, more than 40 predictors. And it includes uh, topography, land cover, and so on. So this is a machine learning um, process using XGBoost, one of the one of the main ways in which we are uh, helping to help governments see how much they stand to gain from protecting the area for carbon. And then this allows us to track the emissions and incorporate all these solutions into land use planning. So we can tell the state government, hey guys, on this area maybe you can lock it up for carbon. The area you can continue developing agroforestry and so on and so forth. So what it allows us to really do is to have some more details on getting the reduced emission scenarios uh, from the various logging, logging for log forests in Malaysia. And if you're interested in trying to find out more what we're doing, we're using the very methodology 0010. All right, so just to close off, um, never forget why we are doing this. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to you know, make a quick buck out of this and ultimately, it's important what we're doing is helping to save the forest because it's teeming with, with wildlife, beautiful waterfalls. And this is some of the images of the mammals that we, we captured throughout the entire period. It's, it's difficult just to keep lobbying and asking the government to set aside protected areas, but to show them the money. And the only way, unfortunately, we know now um, to give long term protection to this forest. Still so much to say there.
like spreading COVID. So again, if you're interested to collaborate with us, um, if you can think of three ways in which uh, you could. What we really need in is it's really a lot of the various methodologies are quantifying carbon storage, but they're not giving a, an added premium to biodiversity of custom functions. Uh, yeah values so if we can you know, like provide uh, additional riders on this insurance to try to, to help develop methodologies that others can use because of their biodiversity there they'll, they'll be a great help because right now carbon prices are seriously undervaluing uh, the value of biodiversity present in a lot of areas so no carbon is equal unfortunately but um, some the methodologies are imperfect at the moment so hopefully we can generate better methodologies another research that perhaps i'm interested in is um, comparing the costs and FSA impairment risks in carbon projects that are protecting forests or restoring forests. So it's a big push to plant trees, right? But as you know, planting trees isn't always a solution. Maybe it's better to, it's more cost effective to protect existing forests, the biodiversity. Intuitively, that makes sense, but we need to show the numbers. It's the kind of research that could really then get carbon majors to shift towards investing in projects that protect forests rather than plant new forests. And also the third kind of research area we're interested in is looking at all the idle abandoned land that has a lot of restoration potential. Uh, potentially, if we maximize these lands, for example, for bamboo, sustainable bamboo, we may then minimize the deforestation risk elsewhere throughout the, the state because the state government has enough money to then not lock the forest anymore. So again, using remote sensing and GIS, we may be able to show that and using and with the economists, help of economists, we can do a lot more. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure sharing all this with you. I think it was uh, kind of a lot of information, but I look forward to yeah, answering your questions. And again, thanks, thanks to Yoko and the test group for arranging this seminar. Again, thanks very much, Bill, for having me back. And yep, I'm questions now. Thank you.